you said it's not controversial, the idea to limit the amount of saturated fat you consume. Every major medical society endorses the idea, including the American Heart Association, the World Health Institute of Medicine, the European Society of Atherosclerosis, the Australian Society of Health. All these tell you 10% or less saturated fat. Some say as little as you could possibly get. Please elaborate on this. Yeah, you know, reasonable people would like to advise the public and public health policy uh, of strategies to minimize their individual risk of having a heart attack, having a stroke, maybe developing cancer. And uh, that all ramped up after World War II and President Eisenhower having a heart attack. And it really became a big focus and a necessary focus because still to this day, over 2,000 people a day in the United States alone will die of heart disease. Somebody every 40 seconds has a heart attack in the United States. Yes, we have better strategies to treat them when they're in the middle of their heart attack. My specialty is something I've done you know, thousands of times, but that's not the goal. The goal is prevention of the heart attack. And all these societies have looked at all the data beginning in the 50s until the present time and concluded that we have access to too much food. We have access to a lot of foods very rich in saturated fat, like cheeses in the crust of the pizza, on the pizza, and in the salad next to the pizza, um, and baked goods that are very rich, perhaps in butter, um, very common source of saturated fat, and all animal foods like fish and pork and poultry and red meat. And as a public policy, minimizing those foods, but we have to eat. So replacing them with plant-based foods. As I always say, bean stew, not beef stew. Uh, bean chili, not beef chili. Simple little substitutions will dramatically lower the percentage of saturated fat in your diet. It's the reason the American Heart Association advisory in 2017 also said, limit your coconut oil and palm oil intake because they can even provide more saturated fat calories than a steak. So do both. Don't cook your steak in coconut oil and don't eat either of them. But uh, it, it, there's little doubt that if the public would actually adhere to these guidelines, we'd see a fall off in the very development of heart disease, and then we wouldn't need these expensive and uh, painful technologies to deal with the emergency, could deal with the upstream, avoid the disease, ounce of prevention, lower your saturated fat in your diet, is worth a pound of cure, which is bypass and stent, but they're not really cures, they're just ways to treat this bad disease. How did Finland in the 1970s go from having the highest heart attack rate in the world to dramatically lower? Uh, several scientists were very concerned about Finland. Finland was one of the countries that Dr. Ansel Keys selected to be involved in the seven country study, partly because their diet was very high in animal products, very high in calculated percentage calories from saturated fat. And the observations were that they were indeed having a high heart attack rate. So they were included in the seven country study when it launched in 1958 as one of the 16 sites. But within about a decade, it wasn't just a research project, it was an economic uh, force in the country that young people were dropping dead of heart attacks um, and they needed a response to it. So the government, particularly in a region of uh, Finland that abuts Russia uh, called North Karelia, this region got together a public policy headed up by a physician named Puska Peska and came up with strategies. Can we hang signs in the post office that say, don't smoke? Can we go talk to the sausage makers and have them mix some beans in the sausage meat so that they actually were producing a lower saturated fat food source, a very popular food in Finland? Can we get on the grocery store shelves and educate uh, the people that are making food decisions in the house to use margarines of vegetable oils instead of butter? And, and can we get people to eat a bit more fruit and vegetable during the day? This all was a planned and really very organized, high profile reach pre-internet using you know posters and schools and workplaces and churches and community groups. But it worked because there was a change in the lifestyle, in the diet, in the percentage of saturated fat. Nobody became, to my knowledge, a vegan, but they did shift their diet towards a more plant healthier approach. And the heart attack rate started falling quickly. In five years, heart attacks were 85% less frequent than when they launched the study. It was published and well-known. 
uh, and it made such an impact in the country that the other regions of Finland said, hey, we want to be part of this too. We may not be as high a heart attack rate as East Finland, uh, but we want to participate. And as the whole country adopted these hygienic measures, public health measures, the whole country benefited quite dramatically. So it's a stunning example of the impact of education and lectures and public health on, uh, and the ability of people to actually change their habits, um, just guiding them to healthier food choices. It can actually work. It's very hopeful. You mentioned that the Journal of the American College of Nutrition said intake of fish was correlated positively with the increased risk of diabetes. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, people get really hot under the collar when you say anything that's not positive about fish. Uh, and again, there are people that live in coastal regions and fish has become a mainstay of their diet. Uh, but in most of the United States, we have the option of what's gonna be on our plate. We have grocery stores, we have you know 24 seven access to food. So now we can ask the question, it's not that there's my boat, there's my fishing line, that's the only way I'm gonna eat today. It's I could eat tofu, fish, pork, steak, broccoli. I mean, what am I gonna put on my plate? for enjoyment, what am I gonna put on my plate for health? So fish is uh, something now that's an option. Um, and in general, from our lessons from the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, when you substitute fish for red meat and pork and poultry, um, you uh, have made a trade that may be a little bit better. You're exposing yourself to a little higher concentration of omega-3 fatty acid content of fish flesh. You're still getting cholesterol. You're still getting saturated fat. You're not getting any fiber. Unfortunately, you are getting exposure to some toxins that could include in the bigger fish, particularly mercury, but in all fish, some of the chemicals that are in the environment like PCBs and PFAS and DDT. Um, but nonetheless, that exchange of red meat for fish is probably a health upgrade, but is it really healthy? And as some studies looked at the issue of intake of fish in questionnaires and population and the development of type 2 diabetes, there was a relationship. Higher fish intake, higher diabetes intake. There's the same relationship for red meat. Higher red meat intake, higher rate of diabetes, certainly for processed red meat. Higher bacon intake, higher rate of diabetes. Uh, it's probably characteristic of the fact that all those foods have a higher fat content, a higher saturated fat content, that we believe that those foods uh, will raise blood lipid levels, cholesterol, triglyceride levels, those fats will get into the tissues, muscles and liver, they'll create insulin resistance, and we're on our way to developing diabetes. Not the only thing that leads us to develop diabetes, but uh, one of them, certainly, you know, uh, refined flours and added sugars um, and uh, uh, excess alcohol at all can all lead to weight gain and insulin resistance and development of diabetes. But it appears from epidemiologic studies and our understanding of why this might be true, that fish may actually promote the development of type two diabetes. So um, we're still you know, in the medical community, very happy to recommend the Mediterranean diet, eat fish, not red meat, but optimally um, limit your fish. Uh, Dr. Walter Longo from the University of Southern California and a world recognized longevity expert who doesn't really define himself by any food group, he's just a scientist, say, you know, two times a week maximum might be a reasonable intake of fish. Uh, I, for years and years, have avoided any. And none of the studies that have actually shown the reversal of heart disease, like Dr. Ornish's study, included fish. So um, I don't promote my patients eat fish unless they tell me I'm eating something and uh, that will be, you know, they're going out to dinner choice. Uh, but I still would advise them to keep that very infrequent. Can you sum up everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? Sure. The overwhelming 35,000 foot view of the nutrition world as dirty and contentious and as many food wars have occurred and such leads to one very clear conclusion. At least half your plate should be fruit and vegetables. A quarter should be legumes, beans, peas, lentils. We should drink water, tea, or black coffee, and we should have a source of protein that's as concentrated in the plant world as you'll tolerate, from edamame to beans to nuts to seeds, uh, that will increase your chance of avoiding disease and decrease your chance of developing uh, these non-communicable 
chronic diseases. What's the one thing I need to do today? The one thing you need to do today is cut back on animal foods and eat an apple. What is it about the real truth about health conference that you wanted to come back and speak? This is just a great platform of really esteemed lecturers, uh, really headline lecturers that have done the research, that have written the books, that have talked to the community, and to be amongst that group to both reach the live audience here and the international audience through uh, the mediums that, that we have is just so exciting and so important. So it's a great, great platform. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? I'm all over the internet uh, and all the social media channels, but I have a website, drjoelkahn.com, D-R-J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. And everything I do from my medical practice to my books to my restaurant and other things can all be found there.